Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. During the first months of World War II, in anticipation of bombing raids and a possible invasion by Hitler's Germany, the British government ordered the evacuation of children from London and other cities that might become potential targets. The effort was dubbed Operation Pied Piper, resulting in hundreds of thousands of children being evacuated to rural areas of the country. Two such children were Jack Frisbee, age 11, and his brother Terry, age 7. One day in 1940, Jack and Terry were placed on a train in London by their mother, along with many of their classmates and other neighborhood children, bound for a small village in Cornwall, England. Once in Cornwall, they were to be placed with an unknown host family. Jack and Terry's mother, who clearly desired to keep her boys safe from the bombings in London, was also concerned about their well-being in a household of strangers. Therefore, she came up with a special code for her boys to use once they arrived at their destination. The code was in the form of kisses on a postcard that they would send home. The number of kisses would let her know if they were happy and safe, just okay, or sad and maybe in danger. Thankfully, the boys loved their temporary home and smothered their postcard with many kisses. Terry Frisbee survived the war and went on to become a famous playwright and actor who wrote a book and an award-winning BBC radio play telling the story of his four-year experience as an evacuee during World War II. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we'll be speaking with author, comedian, and financial commentator Dominic Frisbee. Dominic is the son of Terry Frisbee and has a deep desire to bring new light to his father's moving and riveting story. Dominic has adapted, directed, and produced a 10-episode musical podcast called Kisses on a Postcard, which tells his father's story in a very engaging, exciting, and entertaining way. I'd now like to welcome Dominic Frisbee to our show. Welcome, Dominic. Thank you very much, sir. Pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to be speaking with you for a whole bunch of reasons, which we'll get in later. But before we start talking about this incredible podcast musical, Kisses on a Postcard, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Well, sure. My name's Dominic Frisbee, and I have a a weird sort of distinction. I think I'm the world's only financial writer and comedian. Um, But I have to say, this podcast isn't really about me. It's more about my dad. And my dad was a writer called Terence Frisbee, a well-known playwright. Um, He wrote the longest running comedy in the history of the West End, a play called There's a Girl in My Soup, which ran for six years in the West End. And it was a hit on Broadway as well. And it went on to be a film with Goldie Hawn and Peter Sellers. And he wrote this story. And he first wrote it in the 1980s, but it's all about his time as a child in World War II. And I first heard the story when I was maybe 19 or 20 years old. And it was originally written as a radio play and it won the BBC Radio Play of the Year Award. And then it got option to be a film. And it spent the next 20 years in what they call in Hollywood development hell where loads of people optioned it. And for one reason or another, it never got made. And then dad's friend who had founded a thing called the National Youth Music Theatre had been saying to him for years, you should turn this into a stage musical. And then eventually a chance encounter at a golf course in a remote rural location in England meant that it actually got commissioned as a sort of almost a community theatre project, just this tiny project in the middle of nowhere. But because they wanted it to happen, they went away and did it. And then dad's friend, uh, who was another golfing 
friend of dad's wrote the music and this community theater production was put on in 2003 uh with professional actors in the main roles and and amateurs in all the small parts and i just fell totally head head over heels in love with it i've had the theater rammed down my throat since an early age and I'm often pretty bored by it, to be honest, but I just fell head over heels in love with this. And I was like, we have to raise the money to bring this into the West End. And that's actually why I became a financial writer, because I was trying to work out how to turn our small amount of money into enough money. We needed five million quid, which would be at the time, it would be almost $10 million. And that's in 2004 money, not in today's money. So anyway, I, I actually started a podcast as a means to interview these very intelligent people I'd heard talking on the Internet about how to make your fortune. And gold seemed to be the place at the time. And one of the people I interviewed actually offered me a job as a financial writer for her a magazine. So I had that's how I got started in this kind of side career. Anyway, we never quite raised or made the 10 million quid that we needed. And it was just this project's always been on the cusp of happening. And then dad uh, wrote it as a book and Bloomsbury published the book. They published all the Harry Potter books. And again, the book was very successful, but not successful enough for it to become either a film or a stage show. And the reason is why it's, why producers avoid it as a stage show is it's got a cast of 40, including 20 kids. And so that means you need 60 kids. You need three sets of kids. So it's just a logistical problem. Anyway, dad died in 2020, just at the beginning of the lockdown. And I was going through all his stuff and I came across the CD and the script. And I brought it home and it was just every morning. I, I It was just coincidence. But wherever I placed it on my desk, it just seemed to be looking at me. And I was like, if I don't make this happen, nobody's going to make it happen. So during the lockdown, I, I went through the radio play and I went through the book and I went through the um, script of the musical and I decided I was going to turn it into a podcast. I didn't have the means to turn it into a stage show. I didn't have the means to turn it into a film or into a Netflix series, but I did have the means to turn it into an audio project. I've worked in voiceovers all my life. And so I set about adapting it. And then I write comic songs when I write my comic hat. And so I spoke to the guy I write songs with and I said, look, can we tidy up the music? Can we fix the music a little bit? And he said, yes. Uh, and it turned out his dad had had exactly the same experience as my dad in World War Two. And I'll come to that experience in a moment. And so we set about adapting it. And then because it was the lockdown, nobody was working. So we had access to lots of big stars. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so in the main role, we had a guy called John Owen Jones, who's a Welsh actor, who was Jean Valjean in Les Miserables. And he was the longest. He did more performances in The Phantom of the Opera than anyone else. And we've got all these big names anyway. And we then had a lucky break because we had a problem with one of the studios. And at the last minute, I phoned around all the other studios to see if we could get a replacement. And. Abbey Road, where the Beatles performed all their stuff, had had a cancellation and they offered it to us at cost. So we ended up recording the whole thing at Abbey Road. And then I know from my time in podcasting that it's not like in, in a film or on stage, you've got to be tight. You've got to run at two hours. Audiences get bored, but podcasts kind of work better the longer they are. So we ended up turning this into a 10 part serialized musical podcast and there's this thing called the new york festival awards i don't even know what they are but apparently they're like the oscars of radio and we won silver there so it's it's done really well but yeah so we created this 10-part serialized podcast called kisses on a postcard and what i'm doing now is talking about it as much as i possibly can because i want as many people as possible to listen to it because i want other people to fall in love with it the same way i did and I want it to be just become a thing. So it's inevitable that Netflix or Disney or someone have to make a series out of it. So that's how this thing came to be. And I can tell you the story, if you like, in just a second. Yeah, I would love to. I'd love to hear you tell just a, just generally about the story. And then I want to kind of dive in and talk about some of the things that I heard in it, because I was 
I was fascinated by it. Um, when I knew I was going to be interviewing you, I heard about the story. I have some some background, some attachment to the story because uh, my aunt, my mother's sister, was a Vaki. She was uh, about 14 years old in 1940. She got sent out into her school, got sent out into the country and out she went. My mother was uh, 17 in the beginning of 1940. So she was sort of the in-between so she ended up staying in London with her mom, and uh, she was there for the Blitz, most of the Blitz, until she and her mother actually left and went to Lincolnshire um, mm-hmm. for a while until she joined the Royal Air Force herself. But so when I heard your story about your dad, I thought, what a what a marvelous story and a musical to boot. And um, I was blown away by it. It was fantastic. So yes, tell us tell us the story. What is it about? Well. Dad was a small part in what was a huge historical event. And this was, it was 1940. So World War II was now well underway. And there was the famous evacuation of Dunkirk, where all the British soldiers had retreated across the channel, you know, helped by all the citizens in boats to get them back home. And we knew, Britain knew that Germany was about to bomb Britain. The Battle of Britain is about to begin, was Churchill's famous line. And we knew that they were going to bomb all our cities and they were going to bomb them our cities to hell. And so this directive came out from government that every child who lived in the city was to be evacuated to the countryside. And it was the biggest movement of people in British history, somewhere between three and a half and four million children were evacuated but they weren't evacuated with their parents your parents could only come if you were under five so you can imagine the incredible wrench that this will have had across the country and my dad was seven and his brother jack was 11 my dad's name was terry and you know you can imagine just putting your seven year old and your 11 year old child on a train saying goodbye to them and never knowing if you would see them again. And this is what happened to every family who lived in a city in the UK. So my grandmother, my dad's mother, tried to turn the whole thing into an adventure for them. So she said to them, I have to say, nobody knew where they were going, how long they'd be going for, and who'd be taking them in. All they knew is that they were going. You did not know if you would see your kids again. And from the kids' point of view, they didn't know if they'd see their parents again. I mean, it's just such a wrench. It's unbelievable. But as I say, dad was seven and his brother Jack was 11. And my grandmother, their mother, tried to turn the whole thing into an adventure for them. And she did that by giving them a postcard. And on the postcard... She gave them a secret code, like the Secret Service. And on the postcard, it was written, Dear Mum and Dad, arrived safe and well, love Jack and Terry. And the kids were, well, what's the code? And they were to write the address of where they ended up on the postcard and send it home. And if it was horrible, they were to put one kiss. If it was okay, they were to put two kisses. And if it was nice, they were to put three kisses, XXX. And so that was their secret code. And then mum would know. So mum then took the two boys. They each had a label tied around their neck with their name on it. She gave them some sandwiches, packed lunch, change of clothing in their rucksack, gas mask. And she walked them down to the station along with everyone else in their school. And they were put on this train in southeast London and the train pulled out of the station and all those mums and dads were standing there on the platform waving goodbye to their kids never knowing if they would ever see them again I mean what an emotional moment and the train then went all the way across London and gradually made its way all the way across the country to the southwest corner of England a place called Cornwall which is one of the most remote parts of the UK. If you look at a map in the UK, it's in the bottom left-hand corner, in the southwest corner. 
five, six hour train journey from London. They got out of the train. And of course, in those days, people had much stronger accents. There was much more regional diversity of accent and everything else. And they got off the train and they were 50 of them ended up in this tiny village in the middle of nowhere where they were herded into the village hall and made to stand in the village hall. And all the locals stood around them. And the expression at the time was, I'll take that one there. And they were each chosen at random by some local. And that was where they would then spend the war the next four years. And dad had been given instructions not to leave his brother. They were to stay together. So every time somebody tried to pick one of them, they'd go, no, we're staying together. And eventually they were picked out by this Welsh couple who had moved down to Cornwall. He'd actually been a soldier in World War One. And he'd been the only he'd been involved in in the Battle of the Somme in a thing called the Mammoth's Wood Massacre, where only 17 people had survived. And he was the only person from his village had gone home. And because he was the only man who went home to his village and the only man who came back, they ended up him and his wife ended up having to leave the village because of the way that everyone looked at them. And that's how they had ended up in Cornwall. And he now worked on the railways. Dad and his brother my granddad worked on the railways and they were obsessed with the railways. They loved trains, steam trains, like a lot of kids did in those days. Mm. Anyway, this couple took them back to their house. They lived in a tiny cottage in a row of cottages right by the railway. And they lived there with their, their own son, Gwyn, who would have been about 20. He would eventually go off to fight in the war himself. And they were taken into this tiny cottage. There was no electricity only gas lights. There was no lavatory. The, the lavatory was a little privy in the back garden. There was a pig and chickens in the back garden. In the house, there was a, a fire and a cat asleep by the hearth. There was uh, a canary in a cage. And outside, there was a river to dam and the railway and woods to explore. And the two kids thought they had died and gone to heaven they absolutely fell in love with this place and this first song that i'm going to play you now is the two boys on their very first night in the cottage it's about 20 minute maybe half an hour into the story the two boys deciding how many kisses to put on their postcard to send home to mum and I should say the couple that took them in just by way of exposition were called Auntie Rose and Uncle Jack and their son was called Gwyn. And here are the two boys discussing where they've ended up. How many kisses? I vote three. What would mum and dad think of it here? Don't know. No electricity. They wouldn't like that. I don't care. There's no bathroom. I don't care. Outside love. Don't you see? I vote one. I vote three. Just one bed, got to share. All squashed up in it. I don't care. Kisses on a postcard, we must write. Something we've got to do tonight. Kisses on a postcard, what will they show? Only mum is going to know. What about Gwyn? Gwyn's not bad. She says weird things, but she's okay. Not Uncle Jack, though, he plays rough. Pulled my hair, called me scruff. This is on a postcard, what do we do? I still say three. Well, I say two. This is on a postcard, three, two, one. Better be quick or it won't get done. If we put lesson three, Mum and Dad will think it's rotten here. They'll be worried. Yeah, well, there's the trains, they're good. And the station, right next to us. That's terrific. Hey, wait, I've just remembered. Hens. What about hens? Eggs, stupid. Real eggs. Not that horrible powdery stuff. Eggs for you, eggs for me. Eggs for breakfast, up and tea. Poached or baked, scrambled or fried. Or bored with soldiers on the side. What do you say now? What's 
your score? All right, three. I say four. You can't. Why not? Mum only set up to three. But don't you see? The more kisses we put, the more happy they're going to be. Yeah. It's terrific here, really, isn't it? Like being on holiday, only there's no sea. We don't have to stop at four. Let's do hundreds. Yeah. Kisses on a postcard, one by one. All round the edges, this is fun. Kisses on a postcard, squashed up tight. Telling Mum that we're all right. fast asleep and they've covered the card in kisses night night boys wow that is incredible that is such an amazing song and it really sort of sets up the whole story doesn't it it does and and that second part of the song that you heard good night children everywhere it's the only everything else in the musical is original or folk music but that song, Good Night Children Everywhere, is the only original song from World War II that we used. And it was sung by Vera Lynn, who sang a lot of British songs at the time. White Cliffs of Dover is her most famous one. But the BBC played it once and they had to ban it because so many people complained. Not because it was offensive or it had swearing or anything like that, because of the emotional turmoil that it caused. But it was so apposite, we ended up including it in the show. You know, I I think about this whole story about the evacuees and your dad and your uncle were actually quite fortunate, weren't they? I think they were very fortunate. Dad was, used to call it his second childhood. And they ended up with this amazing family. And the story tells the story, really, of this amazing family and the whole of this village turned on its head during World War II. But there were many Vakis who had horrible experiences. There were many who never saw their parents again. There were many who just missed their parents terribly and were scarred by the experience for life. There were many who ended up beaten up, abused. You know, they were wrenched from their families. And I think the long-term consequences of that whole episode to Britain just goes untalked about. You know, it's just one of these forgotten episodes from history. Just, can you imagine a whole generation of kids separated from their parents? And, you know, we wonder about the decline of the family in this country, and then you look at things like that. But anyway, the other kids that really struggled with it were the local kids in the villages where all these city kids ended up. Because the city kids were often just that bit smarter, that bit rougher. You know, they put on all these sports competitions and the city kids would thrash the local kids. And one of the expressions was, the city kids even cheat better. Oh. And the <laughs> dad used to say, we were the grey squirrels and they were the red squirrels. The grey squirrels famously wiped out, the grey squirrels from the US were brought into the UK and they wiped out the indigenous red squirrels in the UK. But the local kids resented these pushy newcomers and the city kids just thought the local kids were all a bit thick and stupid and idiots mm. um, but everywhere they went they fought and fought and fought there were just mass fights dad said describe some of the fights that went on between the vackies and the village kids and yeah there was this huge rivalry so 
it wasn't just the evacuated kids who were affected by it. Yeah, there were a lot of evacuees. So there were a lot of kids and a lot of them, I guess, knew each other from their where they were from. So it wasn't just like one or two were dropped into the village. I guess there was a, there was a rather large group of these children that were delivered to these villages, correct? I think so. I think they they were in schools, you know. So dad said about 50 of them. That would have been, you know, 50 kids from his school in southeast London. Kept the schools together because it was easier to organize that way. Right. What I, what I was thinking about, just going back a bit, I'm thinking as a, I'm a parent, I've, I've got three grown daughters and I have grandchildren. And I am just imagining the horror, the turmoil in my soul of dropping my children off to be taken to a village that has been maybe nominally vetted, um, if vetted at all, and not knowing who's home they're going to end up in. Is it going to be a, God forbid, a pedophile? Is it going to be someone who's just, you know, an angry, bitter person? Is it, who, who who's going to have these kids? And I think your grandmother was quite ingenious. The game that, that she played, in effect, alerting her as to what it was going to be like. But I just think of how your grandmother must have been so torn and worried and concerned about, you know, your father and your uncle. Did you know your grandparents, your father's parents? Yeah, I did. She died when I was about 17 or 18. Mm. Did you ever hear any perspective from her point of view? No, you know, God, I wish I'd talked to her about it. And you know what? Like, I fell in love with this project and I feel I know it better than anyone. But as a result of promoting it, I get asked so many questions and I just wish dad was here to answer them a lot of the time, because a lot of the time I just don't know the answer. But yeah, she was, I can't, I mean, dad said she went home and sobbed and sobbed, but Mm. I think she would have sobbed for days and weeks. I know she came down to visit them to check they were okay. And I imagine other parents did as well. Mm. But, you know, some parents ended up getting killed. Some of the kids ended up getting killed. One of the dads, one of the kids who was down there with dad ended up getting run over by an army Jeep, you know, and so, but yeah, they they didn't, I, I say it again, they didn't know where they were going, who would be, ta- they didn't even know, mum, grand didn't, my nan didn't even know that they were going to Cornwall. Mm. They just knew that it was, they just, they didn't even know that, let alone which village, but they didn't know where they were going, who'd be taking them in or how long they'd be going for. I mean, I just, I mean, it's not like today when we've got mobile phones and we can send each other a text and whatever, you know, it, it's just extraordinary. You know, having having three daughters, I did my share of waiting up nights and sweating, um, you know, looking at my watch, you know, they're a little past curfew or whatever. But I can't imagine months and months going by and not knowing if my children were safe, you know? Yeah. Years. Four years. Yeah. You know, the story that is told through Kisses on a Postcard, it's so many there's so many delightful components to it. When I think of maybe not all delightful, but interesting, it's funny in that it sort of captures the mind or minds of, uh, you know, seven to 11 year olds and what they think about and how, you know, how quickly they were enchanted by fresh eggs (laughs) and, uh, you know, some dairy and some fresh vegetables and clean air. And hey, we can get used to this. This isn't so bad. But there's other things that are, you know, very moving. Like one of the things I picked up and it was sort of the they they went from children, children's view of the war to a more realistic sense of the war from maybe playing with toy planes and thinking how cool this is yeah. like the army to, hey, wait a minute. There's, you know, they witnessed the bombing. They were in, in part of your podcast. And one of the stories is they do. They they're involved in a very scary, real upfront contact with the war. Can you comment on that a little bit, Dominic? Yeah, well, I think in those days, soldiers were a bit like the sports stars of today. You know, they were the heroes. They were the kids' heroes. And, you know, Dad, for example, learnt all the regiments of the UK and by extension the whole geography of the UK because of his brother's collection of army cap badges. Mm. And 
you know, he learnt from, they used to play with dinky toys. I don't know if you had dinky toys in the States, but they would be little steel, well, maybe not some kind of metal tanks and aircraft and so on. Mm -hmm. And so that's how they would learn the names of all the fighter planes and the bombers and the tanks and all the rest of it. And they actually, you know, it was all in their imagination. And then there were a couple of times when they came into contact with the real war. Mm -hmm. And one of those times was the nearby city of Plymouth, which is about 20 miles away from where they were staying. Plymouth is a port on the south coast. It's where Sir Francis Drake famously sailed out from to fight the Spanish Armada. I'm sure you've been taught that mm -hmm. story in school in the States at some point. And I think it's also where the Pilgrim... Um, what's the ship with the Pilgrim Fathers on? Mayflower. I think might, the Mayflower might have yeah. sailed from Plymouth as well. Mm -hmm. And um, but anyway, that's where the British Navy had many of its ships docked. And so it was a target for the Luftwaffe. And dad was actually in Plymouth on a shopping trip with Auntie Rose, the woman who was looking after him, when the Luftwaffe famously raised Plymouth to the ground and just bombed it for three days. And, you know, suddenly bombs going you know they they hid in a uh, in a railway shelter on the railway underneath the ground but the sound of actual bombs going off and you know a lot of the time when you see violence it's actually the sound of violence is what shocks you mm -hmm. and you know but he says the sights and sounds of the real war as opposed to what was happening in his imagination with his toys that was a big reality check and then they all went they in the day they all went back home to the village and then they stood on the local hillside on the tour and just watched Plymouth being bombed. And he just said there was this red, the whole city just had this permanent red glow. And it was just beyond the scope of the fire services to put it out. They just couldn't put it out. It was too much fire. And it just glowed for a week. And he, I think he said like a full storm or something he described it as. And then they're looking at Plymouth have the absolute shit bombed out of it, excuse my language, mm -hmm. and thinking, crikey, that's what's been happening to our parents in London. Are they OK? So that was one example of how they, you know, the kids came into contact with the real war. Mm -hmm. And it's all described in the story, as, as well, you know, with, uh, you know, quite dramatically. It is. You really do feel present in the situation. And when you mention about the the bombs uh, dropping in Plymouth while your father and uncle were in, in the city with, with their Aunt Rose. And I put myself in Aunt Rose's position. You are somebody who is a caring, loving person who has in your charge these two young boys. And the situation, you know, gets out of hand, completely out of her, you know, ability to control it, where you know, your uncle runs off to find something that he had a, a toy knife, I think it was, or a knife. Yeah. And not to reveal too much of the story, but the terror that she had to, that she's responsible for protecting these boys. They've been sent all the way to Cornwall to be protected. And she could have lost them in one, one shot on a day shopping trip into Plymouth. I felt her terror. Um, yeah. Being responsible mm -hmm. for them. And, and the boys not, not totally not totally getting it, but then kind of getting it in the end. As you said, this is what's happening to my parents every day. So the fresh eggs weren't the, all, what it was all about anymore. Now they're worried about their parents and that this war is real and this is dangerous. Yeah, it's a great episode in the story. Fantastic. Well, I want to talk about some of the characters. I'll tell you, I'll just tell you another yeah, incident please. from the story where when the Luftwaffe were bombing Plymouth, a German, I think they were called Flying Pencils, which was a type of aircraft, a mm -hmm. Dornier 16, had been shot down. And Dad and Auntie Rose were in the garden as the plane flew over them. And they had the guy, the, the guy with the machine gun at the back of the plane. And the plane came so close to them, they actually made eye contact with the machine gunner. And even though the plane was coming to cross, the machine gunner, had the option to shoot this woman and this little kid. Now, it would have taken a pretty cruel person to do that. Mm 
Mm. And I'm, I don't even know what the laws of war are. I don't think you can shoot a, uh, an enemy civilian, but they are still enemy. But anyway, the, the plane crashed just over the hillside and everyone on board the plane was killed. But dad said he was haunted for weeks after by this, you know, the look on this young man's face, who was the same age as Gwyn, the person they were staying with, maybe 21 years old, who had decided not to shoot him. And, uh, you know, you might have think I'm going to die here. I may as well take out somebody else or, you know, they're awful English or whatever. But anyway, he decided not to shoot him. And then seconds later, he lost his own life as the plane crashed. Yeah, that was a very emotional scene in, in the podcast that was uh, yeah, very powerful. And, you know, I'm thinking about the characters in the podcast, how you develop them so well. Let me talk to your creativity. So your dad wrote this story. It had been made into a stage play, but the the development of these characters and the voices and the dialogue is so rich. Where did that come from? How did you develop that from your dad's story? Oh, he wrote it all. All I did was collate it. The characters are all created by dad. The dialogue was almost all written by dad. You know, when I say, you know, 90%, 95%, the one area of creativity that I brought to it, uh, aside from collating it all and producing it and realising it and directing all the actors and all that kind of thing, but from a writer's point of view, about half the songs, um, I composed the words and my friend Martin composed the music. So a lot of the songs you hear, are written by me not the song you just heard kisses on a postcard but a lot of the other songs are written by me um but a, but the the actual characters and the dialogue that was all dad most of them are true people from his life i mean obviously he's dramatized it a bit but you know yeah the the characters they're all wonderful characters but some stand out to me and one of them is uncle jack he's the best he's a complicated man he's but he sounds like somebody i would really like but you know he's he's firm uh, yet loving and as the story goes on you realize that this man was traumatized by what he experienced in battle and it sort of affected his views on things about um many different things and he just sounded like like everybody's that that uncle that everybody wants to have. He was, as I said, Welsh. He was only about five foot two, five foot three, mm. tiny man. And in World War One, I think you had to be above five foot six, maybe, in order to get into the army. Mm -hmm. But then they started losing so many men, they started allowing the small people in. Mm -hmm. But in, anyway, he was in a regiment called the Welsh Bantams. And I think they were all under five foot four. I might have got those those numbers slightly wrong. But anyway, they were all short. And they famously in the Battle of the Somme came up against the Prussian Guard, who were all beautiful German men above six foot in height. Mm. And when he was, you know, the, the soldiers from that war, they didn't talk about it. But Jack and Terry pestered him. And eventually he told them some of the stories of his time in the trenches. And they said, how can you, if you were, you know, they said it's unfair that this regiment of five foot four men should come up against a bunch of guys who are all over six foot. To which Uncle Jack said, no, everyone's the same height when a bullet hits him. He's horizontal. Mm -hmm. And Uncle Jack had worked in the mines, in the coal mines of Wales, and then he'd gone out to fight in this war. And... If you Google it, you can find out about it. It's a thing called the Mammoth's Wood Massacre. And he was where this Prussian guard met the Welsh Bantams and they just blew the crap out of each other. And only 17 of them survived. It was one of the great massacres of the Somme. And so Uncle Jack experienced that and he went back to Wales. And as I say, he was the only man who, who came back. And eventually they had to leave Wales and he went to work on the railway. And in those days, we, we were at a time when socialism in the UK or very left wing was on the rise. Workers' rights, 
you know, it was on the rise throughout all of Europe, communism as far east as, as, as Russia. But, it, you know, fighting for no more exploitation of the worker. And he was very left wing, very anti-authoritarian. One of his lines is never, 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 never trust your leaders. Because his experiences in the mines and then in the trenches had shown him just how, you know, awful your leaders can be and what they can do to the ordinary people. But he said he would, Uncle Jack would lose his own son, Gwyn, would mm. end up being killed in Sicily. So he lost his own son, his only son. And he would say, Churchill's a hero. Montgomery's a hero. Gwyn is dead. And it's not just this war or the last. It's all history. Into the Valley of Death rode the 500. Who sent them there, eh? Mm. So mm. he was a very... And the outlet for all that anti-authoritarian sentiment um, was, you know, the left wing. And a lot of the people who were left wing in those days would become atheist. Mm. And he became very atheist as well. And I'm not surprised after what he experienced, but at the same time, he loved singing and he loved the church and mm. he loved all the beauty that comes with religion. And he was a deeply passionate and philosophical man. But I guess he had to go through so many of his own horrors that he was always at loggerheads with the vicar, arguing about the church and all the rest of it. But really, when I look back at it, I think Uncle Jack is my dad. I think he wrote it to be, it was the vehicle for him to say all the things that he really thought. Hmm. But I think if you look at great characters in literature and in drama, Uncle Jack is one of them. Yeah, there's a scene where you know, Uncle Jack's sitting in the garden, I guess it was after he found out his son passed away. And uh, that's a very moving. It's a great scene. Great, great scene. I, I, I'll let people listen to it to really appreciate it. But uh, there were some, you know, Aunt Rose is delightful. She's uh, just a, a loving, nurturing person. But it's funny, they're they're nurturing and, and loving, but, you know, they, they have rules. Oh, what yeah. I, yeah, the rules are important. The other thing what I- And what values. I, deep values. And they always want the boys to, you know, never talk bad about their parents and- it was just a nice structure, a nice family structure, I think, that the boys were thriving in, even though they were away from their own family. But you talked about values. One of the yeah. things, like, Dad was always very bright, and he got top marks in the whole school, like, several years before he was in the final year, whereas his older brother, Jack, wasn't very bright and mm -hmm. would always get, you know, Cs and Ds, whereas Dad would get As. And one time he came back from school and he'd got top marks and everything, but he hadn't got straight tens. There was a couple of places where he'd lost marks. And um, he was obviously all cock a hoop because he'd come top of the whole school. And Uncle Jack turned to him and said, uh, why did you um, lose marks? And uh, Dad said, oh, well, a couple of them were for carelessness. And one of them, I knew the answer, but I just forgot. And uh, no, sorry, a couple of them were for untidiness. And one of them, I knew the answer, but I forgot. And Uncle Jack just turned to him and went, so I'm bringing up carelessness, am I? Mm. And, you know, he just brought him down a few pegs uh, mm. and, you know, stopped him getting, you know, ideas above his station, if you like. There was another time when they got caught stealing gooseberries from the old lady who next, lived next door and they got the most almighty telling off, you know, uh, about how dare they do that and they could have just asked and are we are we not giving you enough food and yeah so they they were disciplined as well as being full of love they were disciplined absolutely now you mentioned stealing the gooseberries so granny peters was one of my favorite characters in the podcast because i thought she was delightful she was almost something out of dickens she probably literally was out of out of the Dickens period, she talks about being in London once and all the horses and carriages that were around. And can you give credit to the person who did the lady who did Mrs. Granny Peter's voice? Because that was tremendous. So that lady is an actress called Marcia Warren. 
who, mm. if you watch The Crown on Netflix, she plays the Queen Mother in The Crown. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, she's a very eccentric old actress. I think she's an OBE, but she's won the Olivier Award twice. And um, I just sent her the script and she just agreed to do it. And she's just one of the many people who we were so lucky to have. And But yeah, Granny Peters is this sort of mad old lady who lived next door who had had, I think, nine children. Mm. And they'd all, I think, eight of them had died. And whenever she talked about the war, she wasn't talking about the Second World War or even the First World War. She was talking about the Boer War, which had happened in the late 19th century, I think. And, um, yeah, dad and his brother were caught stealing gooseberries off her and all hell, all hell broke loose. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I connected with that story. Uh, first of all, it was charming and it was it was typical kid stuff and and then getting the dressing down from Aunt Rose and everything like that. But and Uncle Jack. But so my grandmother was born in uh, Hartley, West Paul, I believe it was, and she in Hampshire, 1900. And what, what, sorry, tell, tell me that town, not Hartlepool, Hartley, West Paul, that area down there in Hampshire. Um, I don't know. it. Yeah. And I think her home was in a place called Heckfield. I've actually visited the home that she lived in. It was a cottage. Her father was a laborer. I think it was the Duke of Wellington's estate. He, he worked for a tenant farmer. But anyway, my mother was a British war bride and she came to the, to the U S and married my dad, but my grandparents, followed. They came to the United States. So I grew up with my English grandparents, which was really delightful to me because I learned so much. But I remember as a little boy, I was I loved my grandmother's gooseberry jam. <laughs> now, she didn't make it. She it was imported. She bought it from some shop. And I loved gooseberry jam. And so I, I remember that part. But the other thing is, when my mom was a teenager, she would visit her grandparents down in um, in Hampshire, and there was a, an old lady named Mrs. Giblet. She lived in a cottage next door, and she was like 98 years old. And my mother used to have to go over and sit with her and make her tea and things like that, and she would do that. And my mother would tell me stories about visiting this ancient old lady in a cottage out in the country. So I, when I heard about Granny Peters... I thought about Mrs. Giblet, so I connected to that story. But I thought it was it was lovely. The, the old lady had seen tragedy, had felt tragedy, but she was starved for company, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm very proud of that scene. That that wasn't actually in the in the um, that wasn't in the original musical, but it was in the original radio play, and it was such a good story. I put it back in. It, it was tremendous, and then you, you had some just a few other things that were in there. First of all, the the American soldiers arriving. <laughs> <laughs> that was terrific because I know I remember hearing the stories, you know, the the Americans were was it over overpaid, oversexed, and over here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you wanna do you wanna play we could play that song when the Americans all arrive? Yes. So the great expression, you know, the Americans all came with their sweets, and the great expression that we asked the Americans the kids asked them was got any gum chum and uh yeah lots and lots of american soldiers came to the village uh prior to the d-day invasions and i'll tell you about a bit about some of those soldiers but let's just uh play this song hello how are you good day we're soldiers from the u.s of a Pleased to meet you, sir. Pleased to meet you, ma'am. Pleased to meet you, pretty lady. We're here for Uncle Sam at your service this fine day. Any questions, please just say. Questions? No! What's it like in the States? Is it just like the flicks? What's the weather like? Have you flown in a plane? Are there cops and robbers? Are there gangsters too? Are there cowboys and Indians? Do you know John Wayne? Have you ever seen a puma? Have you eaten a sasuma? Do you like hamburgers? Do your cows go moo? Have you crossed the Mississippi? Have you caught a barracuda? Have you been to Colorado or to Kalamazoo? Have you got pus? No, we have bars. We 
all drive cars. Have you ever had a pasty? No, we have not. Is it true that you eat dogs? Only if they're hot. Have you crossed the Golden Gate? Have you climbed the Empire State? Have you ever smelt a scum? Why'd you call a tramp a bum? Do you have steam trains? Can you tell me, chum? One last question. Have you got any gum? Got any gum, chum? We might have some. Any gum, chum? Now don't all scrum. Any gum, chum? It sure is yum. You can chew it till your mouth goes numb. Got any gum, chum? This sure is fun. Any gum, chum? Do the chewing hum. Yummy yum, yum. Rum pum pum. And, And that, that is how, how you do, do the, the chewing hum. hum. And our own refrigerators Oranges and peaches Eagles, buffalo Bears and avocados A city called Chicago Frightening tornadoes Tropics, desert and snow We've got rodeos and ranches Grapes upon the branches We drink lots of Coca-Cola And there's ice to crush We've got Mormons, we've got Quakers We've got towering skyscrapers But no privies for us Our lavatories flush Do you drink tea? No siree Speak Cherokee Not frequently Do you play billiards? We shoot pool Would you like a game of cricket? We don't understand the rules Do you know Clark Gable? Is Harper really dumb? Have you ever had a Hershey? Have you hit a home run? Please give me an answer Can you tell me, John? One last question Have you got any gum? Got any gum, John? We might have some Now don't all scrum. Any gum, chum? It sure is yum. You can chew it till your mouth goes numb. Go any gum, chum? It sure is fun. Any gum, chum? Do the chewing hum. Yummy yum, yum. Rum pum pum. And that is how you do the chewing hum. Wow, tremendous song. I love that. I love that. So tell, tell us about the soldiers a little bit. Well, Dad always swore this was true. And I thought he was making it up for dramatic purposes. But after Dad died, they had a memorial for him in the village and they planted a tree. And I got talking to some old uh, people who knew him as a child and they swore it was true as well. And then I uh, did some research and I found out it was true. I actually went to New Orleans last year and did some research there, which further showed that it was true. But one of the many uh, regiments that was billeted on Dad's village was one of the all-black regiments from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And in that time, many people had never seen a black man before. And you can imagine how exotic they were to the Cornish. Actually, there's quite a lot of interaction between Cornwall and West Africa over the years. But in any case, you know, just seeing that many black men and dad swore that he was given a tap dancing lesson on a sheet of plywood outside the um, barracks by a man from New Orleans itself. Really? But anyway, one of the um, American soldiers became amorously involved with one of the Vaki girls who by now was actually 16, I think, or 17. The soldier was maybe, I don't know how old he was, 19, 20, whatever. But anyway, she became pregnant, as many English girls did. Mm -hmm. But the big scandal was that it was a mixed-race baby. And um, the girl would be sent to one of those homes for fallen women, mm -hmm. they were called. And... You know, it was a big scandal in the village, not just because she'd been pregnant, because it was a black kid and she was going to be sent away to this home. And who knows what horror awaited her in that home. But anyway, at the end of the story, she actually ended up being taken in with her newborn baby by Auntie Rose and Uncle Jack. That's what loving people they were. And I think they were actually paid a small amount of money to look after dad and his brother. But to look after Elsie was her name and her child. They weren't paid anything at all. No. They just did it because they were good people. That was after they found out their son, Gwen, had been killed yeah. in Sicily, I think, right? Correct. 
uh, man, they were, boy, there were people I would have loved to have known. You just don't seem to have people like that anymore. Mm. Just selfless people. Amazing. Now, I know I've listened to you talk and some other um, podcasts and things, and I understand that uh, you're not sure whether or not your dad had any contact with Uncle Jack and Aunt Rose after the war because of things just life started happening and 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 that. So to, to your knowledge, though, he didn't have much contact afterward. I, I just don't know. He never like I only found out about his evacuation probably when I was about. 14 or 15 and i just was not that interested in it it was only when he wrote the stories that i became captivated and i just he must have had some contact and they must have written I, you know they didn't have telephones mm. so you couldn't just phone him up you know they didn't even have electricity let alone a telephone but they must have written and they must have gone down to visit i just can't believe they would have come back and never had any communication with them again but then again that's what happened in those days. You know, geography was a great separator in a way that it just isn't now. Oh, it, it was a, few, a big block. I remember as a, as a little kid back in the 60s, there'd be a, on a Friday night, there'd be a big ceremonial reading of any letters that we got, airmail letters we got from, from England, from my grandmother's sisters or nieces. Yeah. It was a big deal, you know, never, never a yeah. phone call. Never phone calls. Phone my my mum would have made them write. But maybe just over time and, you know, teenage boys, they, they've they got their own agenda and I guess they just drifted apart. But it's, it's stuck in your dad's heart, though, didn't it? Really? Oh, I'll it. say. And it transferred to you. So just a little more about what was it that grabbed you when you said in the 80s, I guess you were a young, young man, that your dad's, the story your dad wrote, what in sort of engaged you so much that this is something you had a like a mission in life to do. Yeah, I I was just thinking while you were talking, if if I don't get this made, I've got to get this made into a TV show or a or a film. I I just wish I had the contacts or the thing to do it because I know it would be a huge, huge, huge hit on the scale of Oliver or the sound of music or something like that. But I just wish I had the contacts, but I have to make it happen. But it's it's almost taken precedence over my own work, but it's just got everything as a story. It's a huge, huge episode in life, World War II. It's got tragedy. It's got love. It's got passion. It's got comedy. You know, at the end of the day, Dad was a comic writer, and this is full of laughs. It's got brilliant music. It's just got everything, and there's no story like it. And I don't know. It just has to happen. I hope it happens. I pray it happens. There was a lot of balance, uh, different types of people. I mean, you got the the Uncle Jack, you know, he was sort of in, just so um, affected by World War I and and it affected his faith and everything like that. And then, But the, the vicar is very respectfully treated in the story as well. You know, as a, a man, he had wanted to do a lot of good himself. And then you had the Aunt Rose. The vicar and, is a good man. He's a good he's a good man. And, uh, you know, here's Uncle Jack would be in church singing. It sounds like um, he and both he and his son like to sing. Yeah, oh, I'll say they were Welsh. They were Welsh. The, Welsh the lines, made... the Welsh invented singing. My mother used to tell me that. I never understood that. She, to some woman in our church was Welsh. She goes, well, she's a great singer. She's Welsh. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> I think it's a bit like, you know, they said Italian opera singers. Mm. would often you know they learnt their art in the in the valleys mm -hmm. and you know they would often be like herdsmen or whatever and they would just sing and it would echo through the valleys mm. and so it was the 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 geography of and the geology of italy produced the singers that would go on and sing opera and something that it's very similar in wales with the valleys there they're just the 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 way the landscape is, it kind of lends itself to singing, you know, but the Welsh are famous, famous for their singing and brilliant singers. They are bread of heaven. Yeah. Uh, just a couple other quick questions for you. So what do you hope that today's younger generation would glean by listening to this podcast and learning the story about your dad and your uncle? 
at that time in history. I think that's another one of the things about this story is you just learn about what people were like and what life was like, how much, you know, in a lot of ways, life was better then. You know, you had more contact with nature. Mm. You had more, you know, you injured yourself. You had to pick yourself up. You had to deal with it. Life was harder, but you had a lot more contact with people. None of this screens, computers, sanitized, you mm. know, kids were sent out. There weren't car there weren't many cars on the roads. Um, so they had a lot more contact with people. I think families were probably a lot tighter back then. And in a way, you know, we're very lucky to have what we have today. But I also feel that we've lost something. I agree. Family, the family that your father and and uncle left, um, there was another structure that they went into that was also a family. And they were absorbed into the, there were the boundaries, there was the, the sense of safety and order and trust and truth and value to other human beings that just sort of absorbed them in. And I think that they, although I know that your father was undoubtedly affected as were all of these millions of kids evacuated in, in some negative ways, in, in some negative ways, certainly, but it's almost like they received an education while they were there as well from very well-meaning, good-hearted, solid people who had suffered a lot of grief and hardship. And, yeah. You know, they did. And, you know, the church was around them in a way then that it just isn't now not mm. in the uk anyway and you know there's so much to learn from the church absolutely just from the you know singing singing hymns and you sing those wonderful words every day and your readings from the bible and values and you just learn by osmosis i know and my mom my mom knew her knew her scripture inside and out you know i just uh remember hearing stories about my mom's you know child and she lived in she lived in uh kentish town That's oh yeah and uh but i know the church was a bit very big part of the their cultural life really yeah you know, yeah um, it's you know re religion has declined and we're, we're confronted with a, a a generation of people who nobody knows what to believe in i'm sure if uh, you, you know you almost don't need to believe in god doesn't matter. God's almost irrelevant. Yeah, no, <laughs> Religion serves so many other purposes. Anyway, let's not, let's not get on to that. Uh, no, I hear you about that. But just to conclude, really, because this has been a, a wonderful conversation, is um, the actors and actresses that you had the show is it's so entertaining. I can't I can't recommend it more. I mean, I loved it because of my historical time, my general love of history. I see so much on TV now. A lot of Netflix programs and things that are historically based dramas. I couldn't think of a better, better story to be on a larger, you know, venue to get it out there into a yeah. movie, a, a Broadway show or a West End show, as you would say in England. But how do you think your dad would feel about the passion that you have for this story and what you've done with it so far and what you're dreaming about doing with it in the future? Uh -huh. What do you think? I'm sure he'd be very flattered by it and I'm sure he'd be very moved by it and I'm sure he'd share my frustration um, and I'm sure he'd have lots of notes for the actors that I didn't give them and he's probably cursing me for not telling certain <laughs> actors certain things in certain places. But ultimately, I think he'd be very positive. Oh, I didn't know your dad, but I, I would imagine that he would be absolutely pleased by the level of detail that you had. I just have a little footnote here is that what you did with the, there was no small consideration given to accents, was there? Oh, I worked really hard. Yeah. Like one of the problems I had, for example, was is finding people who could do a Cornish accent, mm -hmm. particularly with the kids. And I had to cheat it like mad. In the end, I had two kids did almost all the Cornish accents. Mm -hmm. The Cornish accents of the seniors, I only used Cornish actors or people who lived down there. I've, you know, and somebody said, oh, the Cornish accents weren't very good. And I'm like, yes, they were, because they were all genuine Cornish um, actors playing the parts. And then 
obviously had Welsh actors playing the Welsh roles and the American soldiers. I've since learned that, uh, you know, there's quite a distinct accent to New Orleans and to Louisiana. And like, you know, there's loads of black actors in London, but most of them, I couldn't find any black actors who could do the accent. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but I just, they couldn't do the accent. And, uh, in the end, I've managed to find one guy called Cordell Mostella, who was from Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, OK, I'll take that. You know, it might not be Louisiana, but it's southern US. I'll take Georgia. And he was very good. and He was a great singer. But a lot of the guys who are singing the songs as the American soldiers aren't actually the same actors who played them. Mm -hmm. But in the end, bizarrely, I went on a website called Fiverr where you can hire voiceover artists for like five or $10 and just typed in either New Orleans accent or Louisiana accent. And I got three guys, three different guys who were all, one of them was from New Orleans and the other was from Louisiana and the other was from, I want to say Mississippi or somewhere, mm -hmm. but they were, so they were genuinely from that place. So what you hear in there is genuine and one of the new one of those new orleans accents actually sounds a bit weird to me it doesn't sound like any other american accent i know or have ever heard but he was going listen just trust me i'm from new orleans and this is what people from new orleans sound like and so yeah so we had but i put a lot of i wanted to make sure i got that right because I, I i think it when i hear other when i watch films or listen to radio drama and, and the accents are crap it really destroys it for me so i wanted to make sure i got that right oh yeah definitely i just tell you it was just a wonderful experience just the listening to the accents is just incredible there's a real what's the word landscape of accents in the show yeah the united states is huge i'm in northern new jersey i'm 18 miles west of manhattan people say oh you've got a real you know new jersey accent but then we've got relatives in Brooklyn, you know, or in Long Island who have a, a, a much different accent than, than we do. But in, in, in England, it's the same thing. You've got different regional areas with very different accents. You do. And the accents have changed over time as well. What you find is, I think, with TV and radio and mass media, accents have homogenized a lot more. But, you know, in the, the 20s and 30s, before TV and radio were widespread, you know, somebody's accent would change 10 miles up the road. Yeah. You know, it's much more localized. Yes. People said my mother lived in this country. If she came here in January 1948, she died in 2006. She had a very distinctive English accent, London accent, yeah. her whole life, never changed. Some people said, is she putting that on? <laughs> she, she must be making it up. But your accent definitely, like if I've watched videos of me talking when I was 15 years old, my accent would be very different now. It changes with time. I listen to watch videos of my dad talking in when he was in his 20s and 30s and play, compare them to how he was in his 70s and 80s. And his accent is almost totally different. Yeah. So it changes with time. Definitely. Now, Dominic, you're a gentleman. Thank you so much. Now, how can people uh, listen to your yeah. A podcast kisses on a postcard i know i was able to easily call up the podcast and listen to it it's on different platforms right yeah you can just type into your apple podcasts or whatever you listen to podcasts on spotify whatever google podcasts kisses on a postcard and it'll come up or you can go to kisses on a postcard.com and there are links there and if you want to buy a cd it, it's totally free to listen to you know, I just want as many people as possible to listen to it. So I'm going to lose a fortune or I've already lost a fortune on it and I don't care. But the, you know, that's not what this is about. But if you want to buy a CD, I can ship them to America and it's a four CD pack and you just will go to kissesonapostcard.com and you can order CDs there. Or there are also links at kissesonapostcard.com to all the various podcast um, providers, you know, Apple Podcasts and so on. Thank you for what you're doing for history, for the arts, just making people aware of what happened, what we've been through, because you certainly can learn from what happened in the past, can't you? And uh, to learn where we came from, what experiences did people from our families have? And 
you know, what did they go through and how can we reflect upon that as we look forward, you know? Yeah. Thank you very much for all of that. And um, I'm just doing my little bit. Dominic, thanks again. God bless. And I hope really, really a lot of success for you in the future. And I want to see this on the big screen or, or on Broadway. I really, I just think it's fantastic and, and it's, it's fun, but it also tugs on the heartstrings. Let us hope somebody's listening who is influential enough to make it happen. <laughs> okay. Hope we can help with that. Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.